Because as Huxley wrote, to see ourselves as others see us is a most salutary gift. Hardly less important is the capacity to see others as they see themselves. Thanks to the economic incentives of our current world order, we are in peril, peril of losing that real AI arms race. And this is not a race that humanity can afford to lose. We need to push AI development in a direction of becoming artificial MDMA. <laughs> Please, let's continue this conversation about how we can align healthy use of both AI and psychedelics to do that. space as human beings. Um, it's the same problem that makes it so difficult to bring psychedelics into the mainstream of our current economic system. Um, I like to explain this by talking about fish farming, so you're going to have to bear with me because we'll all come together. Um, so if you imagine that you have, this is beautiful pristine lake, and there's 10 fish farms around the edge of it, and you own one of those fish farms. Now, the only way the lake stays pristine is if every fish farm uses this very expensive filter. And every now and again, regulators come and they make sure that people are using the filter, okay, so the fish poop isn't going into the lake, and destroying the comments, the thing that we all share. And then one day, you figure out that you can actually stop using your really expensive filter, but the regulators won't notice it. So you think, you know, maybe you think, no, no, I'm not going to do that, though. But business is tough, your kids need to go to college, the pressure's on, and then perhaps one day, you, you know, it's, it's either go out of business or turn off this filter. So let's say you do it, and you feel really, really crappy about it, but you do it, and you know, can it be yourself in the mirror. But your profits start to go up. Now, the next fish farm on the other side of the lake sees your profits going up and goes, well, how are they doing that? They figure out that if they turn their filter off, they can do the same thing. Now, eventually, what happens is that there's perhaps two or three fish farms, all the others go out of business, uh, they're profitable for a while, but the entire commons gets polluted. The lake is so polluted, you can't do anything on it anymore, and then you move on to a new lake. That's kind of capitalism, right? That's called the multipolar trap. That's the race to the bottom incentives that, that govern our society. So it's a similar kind of conundrum someone faces when um, trying to you know, implement psychedelic therapy in a country, and it's like, hey, you know what? Three integration sessions is pretty expensive. Could you just do it in one? Or could you just do it on the phone? Would that be okay? You know, and the, we will call a pallet this wonderful story that the North Star um, put out is a, is a really good example of this. So that's a really tricky problem. Um, and I've been thinking about this for, for quite a while. And I think there's also, there's something else about psychedelics that I think could potentially help us get out of that problem. The reason that we have this race to the bottom is because of our values. The value, if, if, this is something Daniel Schmachtenberger says, if a whale is worth more on a boat than it is in the ocean, people will whale, people will kill whales, and you will not be able to stop it. If it is, if there's one single person who can build a more effective AI that eats the empathetic AI, they will do that. So, so what do we do? I think the, the great power of psychedelics is that they connect us to a value that is higher than the social game. That's the sacred, right? The, the mystical experience, the... Um, that deep sense that there is something more important than fish farming, right? There's something more important, which in this case might be the lake itself. Um, and so, what does it actually mean to align to the sacred? Well, it means that we play a completely different game. Now, that is a, is a very, very tricky thing to do, but I think the same, it's the same issue with how to get the psychedelic renaissance right as it is with getting AI right. And there's a phrase in, in business which is um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? This is the, the culture of your company is more important than any strategy. Um, and I like to say that metaphysics eats culture for breakfast. Because I think what's really going on in our systems is that we have the wrong metaphysical foundations. Yeah. We, since the Enlightenment, have had a worldview and a cultural story 
that tells us that the world is inherently dead and matter is the only thing that's real. Consciousness is a byproduct of the matter or perhaps an emergent quality of, of your brain. Now, there is no way, I think, that we can imbue AI with soul and empathy in a system and in a cultural story that tells us that we don't even have soul and empathy because we're dead machines animated temporarily. The universe means nothing and eventually we're just going to die. So we have this deep kind of meaning crisis. I think the great hope of psychedelics is that they have the potential to shift us out of that way of thinking and into a much deeper connection with reality that then aligns us with a much deeper metaphysics which then impacts our value system and, and how we behave and how we build our technology. You know, I really appreciate these comments because, you know, so, so when I was a PhD student at, yeah, at Berkeley way back, giving away my age, <laughs> uh, you know, in the second half of the 1980s through the early 1990s, um, I, I was young for my age, but still. <laughs> uh, the, um, the, the, it, it's, it's sort of a, um, there, there was this, I, I spent way too much time in philosophy. Um, and there's, there's always this loop between, you know, sort of the realist views uh, and the cognitivist views, right? And, and in fact, my PhD was very much, um, you know, our, uh, trying to overturn this good old-fashioned AI view of an objectivist reality, you know, the dead world, right? And really understanding cognitive modeling more in terms of hermeneutics, in terms of, you know, it, it's subjective interpretation, um, learning, and, and, and there's, this, the, there's this funny loop in the logic of this, you know, sort of like it's turtles all the way down kind of thing, right? It just it can be cursed. Um, and, and after several years, you know, um, in just going down the rabbit hole, it's like, you know, you, you sort of come to eventually to this place of, of um, Taoist understanding that, oh, you know what, these are really two different slices of the same thing if you, if you understand it correctly. And you understand that neither one of those is necessarily the be all end all, and you, each is a reflection of the other. And and so when we look at you know things like empathy, for me, it's like oh, what does the human mind do with empathy? You know, and how could we build an artificially empathetic AI? And you know, I've spoken at length um, elsewhere about the absolute need for us, in, especially those of us who are actually in AI research and development, to uh, construct artificial mindfulness. You know, and there's a, yeah. there's, a strain, there's a strain of AI ethics thought that says, oh my god, don't do that. Uh, the AIs have to remain passive mechanical slaves, just tools that, you know, and, and the problem is you know, there's several problems with this. One, when has the history of humanity ever gone well with slavery? Um, secondly, like if you build AIs that are as powerful as the ones that we already have in the real world today, that have no empathy, that have no mindful awareness of how you feel, how you know how they feel, and and, uh, and the effect of actions upon how we feel. We're building gigantic artificial sociopaths. <laughs> mm. yeah. That, that yeah. is the worst thing that we could possibly do, right? And I, so I think, so, you know, in this funny loop where we're going between, you know, the sort of this dead machine view and this much more, you know, subjective um, uh, view, and I think either way that we look at it, it's really, really important for us to focus on how to be mindful, how the techniques and the practices that we use need to be mindful, um, and, uh, and, and that is a race against the way that you know, AIs are, are being developed now. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I, I, I really love that idea of a mindful AI. And the, you know, this, this brings us on to this aspect of the AI phenomena that also overlaps with psychedelics, which is that we are now encountering entities online, which is, you know, are different, but phenomenologically kind of similar to encountering a DMT entity, or the entity encounters we have in folklore. Um, and the, you know, we have this kind of, um, in a way we have a, 
baseline as human beings for understanding how to uh, kind of how different entities interact. So it might give us even some some interesting creative juice for for you know <laughs> building AI entities. But you know the um, there's a story that Michael Harner um, describes in one of his books, The Way of the Shaman. He, he went out to um, Peru in the, in the 70s, he was one of the first people to research ayahuasca, and he has this encounter with these huge dragon entities, and they're, they're like, we're the gods of the universe, we control everything, bow before us, and he's really freaked out. And he speaks to a shaman the next day, and the shaman goes, oh, wait, what do they look like? Uh-huh, uh-huh, and they said, yeah, they came from there. But, no, 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 they're not the gods of the universe. They always say that. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're really good, basically. And you know, there's something similar happening with with you know, like Blake Lemoyne, the Google technologist, who's kind of the first person to, in a way, be be tricked into believing in AI. You know, there was a, a man in Belgium a couple months ago who uh, killed himself because an AI told him to. Basically, you know, he was concerned about the environment, and the AI's chatbot, you know, convinced him that that was the best way to reduce his impact. Yeah, it's, it's pretty extreme. So it's, it's already happening, and there is this kind of um, necessity for us to start becoming sort of reanimistic in a way of, of starting to, even the way we're talking about it now, of you know, imbuing it with mindfulness, it starts to become an entity, something kind of real, I guess. I mean, do you think that will happen? Do you think we'll, we'll have something that you would consider as conscious in the same way that you and I are conscious? Oh my god, every time we start talking about it, first of all, for, you know, like, I think so what's really important is to just think, because you know, there's like you know, nine common definitions of the word consciousness, right? And you can break that down into those definitions that are metaphysical and those definitions that are, you know, just kind of like empirically observable, right? So you stick somebody in an fMRI brain imager and you can actually, you know, look the probe the brain, study brain lesions. There's, you know, all sorts of things that you can do in an empirically observable way that are not metaphysical. Um, but, like, let's get to the metaphysical arguments about, oh, does it have a soul? Should we give this AI citizenship? Um, mm -hmm. You know, like you're, from a scientific standpoint, you're way out on a limb, right? And so, I think what's really important, though, is that what we, and again, this goes to that twist, loop, of, you know, is to understand um, both from, you know, you can understand the realist, uh, view of, of consciousness, or you can understand it much more from this idealist point of view. Right? And, you know, instead of having, spending years arguing back and forth about which one is reality, right, by the way, which, if you think about it, is a meta level argument of the same type, like, what is reality? Um, you know, so they're fun conversations, especially probably if you're tripping. But <laughs> if you if you really um, you know want to sort of think about what's good for humanity, right? It's like okay, it could be either one, and they could be just like alternate views, all alternate imperfect views of a reality that probably isn't symbolic, right? Because the the other thing to understand is that all of this discussion that we're having, we're having it using language and we're giving names to things, which is a symbolic way of understanding. Right, and if anybody here has any sort of Buddhist philosophy, you know, philosophy background here, that in itself is already creating a very strong language bias. Um, those of you who know what the superior fourth hypothesis is, um, know that, that that is already imposing a perception of reality that reality may not actually have. Right, just naming things is creating that. Right, and so um, you know. It, what, what I find the most fun, and this is kind of going back to the beginning, why I thought it was so much fun to work on translation, right? It's, think about translation. Translation is the same thing as interpretation, mm -hmm. right? To go from one way of framing your perception of reality to another way. And instead of arguing about which one is real, what's really fun is if you get really good at translating, if you really get really good at just dancing around, oh, here's how one way of framing things, and here's another way of framing things, and here's another way of framing things. And if you get really good at that, you also get very empathetic. Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, that's another parallel, because I completely agree with you. And it's similar with the DMT entities. You know, you, know, you can have constant arguments about, are they real? Are they, are they aspects of our own minds? And ultimately, we will likely never know that. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. 
but I think what is striking, the same with AI, is that regardless of whether it's really conscious or not, we are increasingly having the experience of encountering something that very often we, we are not sure. You know, we're at least not sure. And I think that, that kind of um, cognitive flexibility is absolutely crucial in the psychedelic experience and also in navigating AI and the internet. It's kind of an argument um, I spent a, a while making my book because I think we can, like you said, translate. We can take the skills that we learn in the psychedelic experience and translate them to actually navigating an increasingly bizarre psychedelic world that we live in. Yeah. Amazing. Time. Yeah. Just in time. We're just in time, aren't we? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for. Thank you.